There's a growing phenomenon in our economy today called the sharing economy. And there are great examples of this phenomenon at work here in Western New York. But we're here today to talk to you about our neighborhood, University Heights. And it's a neighborhood where people are using the sharing economy not just to share, but also to build. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where our story begins. This is 63 Lisbon Avenue. And no, those aren't toothpicks holding up that second story porch. Those are two by fours that my landlord hastily threw up. I use this picture sort of as a symbol of the type of disinvestment and absentee landlordism seen throughout the University Heights. Uh, but me and my roommates decided, you know, we didn't want to be a victim to this cycle, that we wanted to do something about it and make our apartment nicer. So we leaned on our parents. We raided their garages of the tools that we needed to do a lot of the work ourselves. And in the end, we were able to come up with this mutually beneficial agreement with our landlord where the money, the time, and the resources that we invested into our apartment, we could deduct from our rent. So he got a nicer property, we got a nicer home, cheaper rent, and we both won in the end. Unfortunately, these patterns of blighted properties, disinvestment, and absentee landlordism, they're all too common in University Heights. And it's the people, ourselves, our neighbors, the people who live in the community that suffer the most. These properties send a message to the community that nobody cares. At least the person who owns that property doesn't care about their building, and they definitely don't care about the community. But rather than making a big issue out of this, we see it as an opportunity. If people like Darren and his housemates were living in 63 Lisbon, there may be other people like them living in these other blighted properties. And this is really where the tool library was born from. This need for a centralized resource in the neighborhood where people who wanted to make a difference, who wanted to see change happen, could come and gain access to the tools that they needed to make that happen without having to spend a small fortune in the process. And so working with a classmate at UB, I sat down and wrote out a business plan for the University Heights Tool Library. So to begin with, you know, what is a tool library? How does a tool library work? Where do the tools come from? And at the end of the day, what is the purpose that it serves in the community? And thanks to the support of a local council member, $15,000 in seed funding to get us off the ground, a lot of hard work, a little luck, we were able to find a vacant storefront on Main Street and turn it into the beginnings of the tool library. Now, you hear 15,000 clams and you're thinking, holy cow, that's a lot of money. But when you have things like rent and utilities, and nicks and cuts insurance that you gotta cover, that $15,000 disappears really quickly. And so for the first couple months, you know, we only had three rakes on a wall. People would walk into the tool library and say, what is this? Are you trying to be a hardware store? Or is this some sort of weird public art installation? But what they were really walking into, what they were seeing, is the emergence of the sharing economy in University Heights. A tool library is like a book library, but instead of borrowing books, you borrow tools. And in University Heights, that membership only costs you $10 for the entire year. And we can proudly say now that we have a few more than just three rakes on the wall. We have over 600 tools that people have access to. And this is really what the sharing economy is all about, having access to things rather than owning them outright. Most people who come into the tool library really just need a hole in the wall, they don't need the drill itself. And really, there are other great examples of the sharing economy at work here in Western New York. People are sharing office space and office services at Cowork Buffalo on Main Street and at DIG at the Innovation Space at the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. They're also sharing bikes and cars using services like Buffalo Car Share. And then nationally and internationally, people are using and sharing rides to get from point A to point B using services like Uber and Lyft. And people are even sharing their couches, their apartments, and their houses using things like Airbnb and couch surfing. These sharing economy alternatives often come for free or at a fraction of the price that it would be otherwise. And this little fact that it saves people money means that the sharing economy isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And central to the sharing economy is this idea of collaborative consumption or the fact that multiple users can use the same good without ever actually having to own it. And so take this stat up here. It might seem a little startling that the average power drill is only used 12 minutes over its lifetime. But really think about it. How often have you used that drill? 
maybe a couple times to hang a few pictures or to put a bookshelf together. But other than that, it's just sitting there idle, not being used. And so what collaborative consumption allows us to do is scale that 12 minutes up to 1,200 or 12,000 minutes used across hundreds of users on thousands of different projects in the community. And when we started the tool library, this was very much uh, our thought process, this one-to-one -one relationship of someone has a drill, they don't need it, so they can donate it to the tool library. Someone needs a drill and doesn't, have, doesn't own one, they can gain access to it through this centralized resource that the tool library becomes. And so it was very much focused on the individual in how can I use this tool? So the longer that we manage the tool library, the more we realized that the community was approaching the tool library from a completely different perspective. And when I say the community, I'm talking about the block groups and community associations that we have in the neighborhood. These are groups that typically form in response to neighborhood challenges or problems. And they were using the centralized tools at the tool library to help them solve those problems. We saw that when you give a tool or you share a tool with an individual, they accomplish a task that they probably would have done anyway. But when you give a group of tools to a community, they start doing things that they couldn't do before. And so it was really interesting to see this evolution of the tool library from this physical space where individuals would come to get tools for their individual projects to this social space where members of the community would come together and talk and share their hopes, their dreams, but also their frustrations for their neighborhood. And so it started to change and people, instead of walking down the street and thinking, oh, someone should really do something about that graffiti, it started being more, what can we as a community do about that graffiti? And the tool library provided the tools for this community-driven solution to quality of life issues. And so we saw this evolution from collaborative consumption to collaborative construction. And this is what we think is the overlooked point of the sharing economy, the ability for communities to create common visions and to realize them. An early victory for collaborative construction in University Heights is this green space that you see behind me, Linear Park. Linear Park was a place when I was an undergraduate at the University of Buffalo. It was garbage strewn, overgrown, and a great place to get mugged or assaulted on the weekends. I was constantly told this is a that, place that, that you... That wasn't a joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was constantly told that this is a place that you do not go. This is dangerous. Well, one of the block clubs in the area, the Heath Street Block Club, a few years ago said, enough is enough. We're not going to take this anymore. And they got together, organized small cleanups, and started taking care of their small part of the park. Over time, other groups like the Merrimack Street Block Club and the Custer Street Block Club and the University Heights Collaborative joined in the effort. And again, the tool library sort of filled this role as a space where community members could come together and imagine what Linear Park could be, a place that they could walk their dog or ride a bike or bring their family down just to enjoy a really nice day. And it also provided the tools to allow us to scale those cleanups up from just a handful of people to 50, 60, 70 volunteers at a time. It also brought together these two populations in the Heights, students and homeowners, and they got to work together working towards this common vision of a different linear park, of a better linear park. Building off of that, uh, the University Heights Collaborative actually found out that there was over a million dollars in federal funding that the city had been sitting on for over 10 years that was earmarked for a rails to trails project. And we thought, well, we have all this grassroots support. What, is it, what will it take to get this project off the ground? And so with a lot of pushing and a lot of hard work at the ground level, I'm happy to report that $1.2 million is gonna be invested in Linear Park and the surrounding areas this coming spring. And it all started with a block club that had a vision. Now, Thank you. It gets now, better. <laughs> now, you heard Darren talk about how those cleanups went from a handful of people to 50, 60, or 70 volunteers at a time. And anybody out there who has ever had to manage 50 people at the same time in real time knows that it's a very difficult task. And so we took a step back, and we realized that we were using a tool that we all have access to. We were using our mobile phones to call, text, and email with our volunteers and volunteer coordinators before, during, and after any kind of service event 
to make sure that people knew where to show up, what to do, and when to pack it up at the end of the day. And so we looked, we decided that we wanted to look at uh, national and international examples of how other people were using mobile phones to solve their problems. And what we found were some pretty significant examples. In 2008, Kenyan society used mobile phones to monitor post-election violence in that country. And two years later, a devastating earthquake hit Haiti in 2010. People used mobile phones to coordinate disaster response and to find survivors still trapped in the rubble. And even still today, people are using mobile phones and social media to organize themselves, particularly against autocratic governments around the world. But we began thinking more locally and thinking, how can we use mobile phones as a tool in our neighborhood to help solve some of the challenges that we face every day in the University Heights? And so the first opportunity we had to do this was with a project called Buffalo Tracks Graffiti. Uh, working with a bunch of UB students over the course of a semester, we had them go out armed nothing, with nothing more than their smartphone and actually tag instances of graffiti around the University Heights. And so our motto was, if you see graffiti, zap graffiti. And when they were zapping that graffiti, what they were actually doing is pinning a geolocated picture of that graffiti on a publicly accessible Google map. And this map didn't just hold the address and photo of where those graffiti points were. We also asked volunteers if, to answer a few simple questions on each point of graffiti. What surface is it on? How severe is the graffiti? And is it offensive? These simple points of information allowed us to effectively plan and strategically plan how best to use our limited manpower, money, and materials to mitigate the problem of graffiti in University Heights. <clears throat> but some of those surfaces, uh, particularly brick and masonry, provided a, an additional challenge in terms of removing the graffiti. So we had to think of something else. And so take, for example, this wall that we had painted probably half a dozen times. And every time, the tagger would come back and tag it again. And so we thought, well, why don't we take a different approach? Why don't we look at this building as a canvas for public art? And why don't we invite public artists to be part of this anti-graffiti initiative? And so instead of this wall being tagged again and again and again by graffiti artists, it's now tagged again and again and again on Instagram with the hashtag University Heights. And that bird has made its rounds. Now, we, have, we use this opportunity not just to remove the graffiti, but also to give the community an opportunity to help shape its identity even more. Here you have two examples of murals that were done by a local artist, Vinny Alejandro. Uh, that he worked with the community to help us identify certain elements of our community that we wanted to share. Here you have a lamppost that's at the corner of Maine and Education. University Heights is right next to a large public research institution. And on the, I think it's to your left, uh, there's a mural that's called Higher Learning in University Heights. And this helped to create a sense of place and identity for the community. The next opportunity we had to use mobile phones as a tool was with a project called Retree the District. As a community, we had noticed that tree coverage as a whole was unevenly distributed across the neighborhood. So on some streets, you'd have these beautiful tree-lined vistas, while on others, it was more of a barren moonscape. And we were wondering, what's the deal with this unevenness? How can we really bring back our urban tree canopy? And so we committed ourselves to planting a thousand trees across University District over the next two years. But one of the caveats was we had to figure out where those thousand trees were going to go. So we went to the city of Buffalo. We knew the city had a comprehensive database of the urban tree cover in the city. But through our conversations, we learned that the city hadn't had the opportunity to update, comprehensively update that database since 2001. And for those of you who are familiar with Western New York, know that in 2006, there was a freak snowstorm that wiped out a big portion of our urban tree cover. Now, here we were, a community in 2014, and we needed to figure out where to plant those trees. And so again, we armed a uh, small army of volunteers with nothing more than their mobile phones and asked them to report on an address-by-address -address basis some very basic information, simple information. Is there a mature tree there? Is there a newly planted tree? Or was there no tree? Or was it something else like a light pole or a fire hydrant? And this is what we found. And what we were able to do 
instead of having a physical manifestation of collaborative consumption, as we saw with Linear Park, we actually had this digital manifestation of what our neighborhood looked like through the lens of tree coverage. And we crowdsource over 2,600 points of data on this Google map. And so you really get a sense for where those tree line vistas are and also where those barren moonscapes are and where the trees could eventually go. Now, a lot of people talk about big data as a solution for some of our biggest social problems, but we tend to think that there's another option in there. This small data, this tiny data, can be used to facilitate community-generated... I think that's material for another talk. Got it. But still, here, when we would scale up the data, uh, this neighborhood-level data, on a street-by-street -street basis, we were able to actually understand our neighborhood from different perspectives. Th these data tell us quite a bit about these data tell us quite a bit about crime and public safety in our neighborhood on a street by street basis, as well as different levels of community engagement. And so, if you look at the charts up on the screen, and the one in the top right, you see there's an overwhelming amount of newly planted trees, and you might be wondering, well, what's the deal? What's why is that street so different? And this is Minnesota Avenue, which has one of the most active block clubs in the community. And so this community engagement and this um, work of the community is actually reflected in this very localized data. Now, this is the real promise of the sharing economy. While we do recognize and appreciate that it opens up this space for collaborative consumption, we get more excited about the prospect of collaborative construction. The sharing economy allows communities to not only identify problems and develop solutions to address those problems, but it also, through technology, allows communities to set goals and measure progress toward the achievement of those goals and define what success even looks like. And as collaborative const construction allows communities to continue to build these shared visions for the future, we think it's pretty awesome that the sharing economy also provides the tools to make those visions a reality. Thank, Thank you. you.